honor to Pastor Anthony and his wife, Sister Michelle, First Lady. I can call her that because she ain't here. Love and appreciate them greatly and dearly for all they've done, their leadership, everything they have instilled into my wife and I. I'm truly grateful. I'm grateful for Pastor Tim and his wife and family. So glad to have them with us, right? Amen. So glad that they're here assisting us and facilitating the, vis the vision that God has given to Pastor Anthony. And we greatly appreciate them. And I give you all honor today. You may be seated. I have a lot to say in a little time, so I'm going to do my best to get through this as quickly as possible, but I want the Spirit of the Lord to lead us today. It is in the 13th chapter of the book of Samuel that we find recorded that though his reign as king had only just begun, it did not take long for that which had just recently been given and entrusted to him and being king over all of Israel had already seemingly in the blink of an eye been stripped from him. In his impatience and unwillingness to trust what God had already spoken to him, he, out of desperation, oversteps his level of authority and enters into a place where he had not been given the authority to operate. And we could stay there and preach there for a while, but in short, I want to speak very quickly to someone that do not allow your desperation to push you to a place of disobedience. Lean not to your own understanding, the writer of Proverbs said, but in all of your ways, acknowledge him, trust him, and he will direct your path. Let Saul be an example to all of us not to overstep, no matter how confusing and perplexing the circumstance may be. If he said it, then that settles it. Period. But we see from Saul that his poor choices did not end there. And we will, for the sake of time, not get into all the ways that Saul failed, but it was what happened directly after the man of God confronts him regarding his sin and offering sacrifice unto the Lord, which was not his role at all. That we find in the next few moments, I would like to point our attention to. For it is here that we find a very perplexing scene of battle. First Samuel chapter 13, verse number 17. Saul, Jonathan, his son, and the people present with him remained in Gibeah of Benjamin, but the Philistines encamped at Michmash. Then raiders came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned onto the road of Orpha to the land of Shaul. Another company turned to the road of Beth Horon, and then and another company turned to the road of the border that overlooks the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Now watch this. Now, there was no blacksmith to be found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, lest the Hebrews make swords or spears, but all the Israelites would go down to the Philistines to sharpen each man's plowshare and his mattock and axe and his sickle and the charge for a sharpening was a pin for the plowshares, the mattocks, the forks, the axes, and to set the points of the goad. So it came about on the day of battle, there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. But they were found with Saul and Jonathan, his son. I find this battle scene so perplexing because it is here that we find God's chosen people in a very compromising and vulnerable position. 
regardless of their armor and irrespective of their makeshift weapons they have accumulated and collected, they still find themselves at a total disadvantage. All because the enemy had found a way to remove from them anyone with the ability and the knowledge to take and forge a sword or a spear, which in those days were used as the main instruments of combat and battle. And so in Israel, the Bible tells us that they had no sword. They had no spear, nor did they have the means in which to make either of them. They were, in comparison to their adversaries, powerless. Sure, if it came to it, they would be able to take down some of their enemies with their makeshift weapons, but eventually their, their, these, these weapons that they were using would fail because they were instruments not made for war. They were farming tools. And to make matters worse, in order that they would be able to use these farming tools, these makeshift weapons in, in a remotely effective way, they had to go to the people in whom they were to do battle with and pay them to sharpen their axes, their sickles and forks and whatever other farming tool they could in any way be yielded as a weapon. Even then, they were not prepared to do battle. And so instead of facing their adversaries, the Philistines, seeing that their army numbered and their enemy numbered 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people, the foot soldiers, the Bible says at, that were as the sand of the sea, which is on the seashore, too numerous to even number. And while the children of Israel numbered 2,000 that were there with Saul at Michmash and 1,000 who were with J Jonathan and Gibeah, so we have 3,000 pitted against 36,000 plus. And they, the children of Israel, did what any soldier in their right mind would do when they knew how to count. They ran. Some hid themselves in caves, others in thickets, others in rocks, high places, and even in the pitch. Some even ran across the Jordan into the land of Gab because for a soldier engaging in battle against your adversary without the proper tools, it's suicide. But what I want us to notice here today is that it was the enemy, the adversary, who had stripped from them any possibility for them ever again to arm themselves properly. They removed every smith and forger from them so they could no longer produce that which the Israelites could use that would pose a threat to them. You see, our adversary, the devil, is not threatened by you or I when we come down to do battle with him and we are ill prepared for it. When we do not have the proper, proper tools for which to do battle, he is not afraid of you. Now, I fully realize and understand that in the context of this story, we are speaking of a physical sword, a literal tool used in battle in this scenario that we find in 1 Samuel 13. But for us spiritually, we are called to carry a sword of our own. But too many times we show up on the battlefield ill-prepared because we are not carrying the one and only thing that has the power to destroy the adversary in which we fight against. Instead, we come to him with some makeshift instrument of destruction of our own making, thinking that it will suffice in fending off the attacks of the enemy. But the devil just looks at you and he laughs because he understands more than anybody else. You are ill prepared for battle. And in the end, we, we like the Israelites find ourselves cowering in caves in fear. Because the enemy begins to employ his greatest weapon against humanity. His words. 
his words, which are all lies, push us back into a corner and makes us feel completely helpless and hopeless. And we do our very best to tell ourselves to just think positive. Just believe that you can do it and you can get out of it. You've got this. You're a winner. When the reality is that those aren't even your words. Those are lies that the enemy told you. And when you, when you went to Google instead of going to God. Because the world says. You don't need God. Just believe in yourself and you can accomplish anything. That is a lie from the pits of hell. The only thing you need is Christ and him crucified. You don't need anything else. You don't need some psychologist. You don't need some medication. You don't need drugs or alcohol. You need Jesus Christ. He's the only thing that has the power to save you and to rip you out of the darkness of your despair. Nothing else can do it for you. If it could, you wouldn't be here today. These are lies. The enemy has told us when you went to Facebook instead of going to the book. Lies that the enemy of your soul told you and fed you while you consume your daily dose of whatever TV preacher, media preacher you listened to who told you that everything you need was to win was inside of you. But the last time I checked, Paul said, I know that in myself, in my flesh, there is no good thing. If you had it within you, you would be able to get yourself out of the depths of sin that you found yourself in. But your flesh cannot do that. Hear me. Your victory is not based on your talent, your gifting, or whatever positive energy you can conjure up. David told his adversary, he said, you come to me with sword and with spear, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts. The God of the armies of Israel, who you have defiled, and this day, The Lord will deliver you into my hand and I will strike you and take your head from you. Uh, Those weren't David's words. Those were the words of God. Hear me clearly today. You don't need another pep talk. You just need a revelation of the name. You don't need another self-help book. You need a fresh revelation of this forever settled word of God. Uh. It's this word that John spoke of in his gospel. When he said in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was not anything made. That was made in him was life. And the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness. And the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man who was sent from God. Whose name was John the same. Came for a witness to bear witness of that light. That all men through him might believe. And he was not that light but was sent uh, to bear witness of that light. Uh, That was the true light, uh, which lighteth every man uh, that cometh into the world. Uh, He was in the world, uh, and the world was made by him, uh, and the world knew him not. Uh, He came to his own, uh, and his own received him not, uh, but as many as received him, uh, he gave to them power 
power to become sons of God even to them that believe on his name which were born not of blood nor of the will of flesh nor of the will of man but of God and the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory the glory is of the only begotten of the father full of grace and truth the greatest weapon the child of God could ever possess on their person is an understanding that I'm already victorious and it is not based on my talent nor my ability, but thanks be unto God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. When we are buried with him in baptism and take upon ourselves that blessed holy name. And we receive his Holy Spirit with the initial sign of speaking with other tongues by virtue of genetics. What had solely once belonged to him is now passed on to us. And because he lives in a perpetual state of victory, now we as children of the light have the same God-given ability to walk in a perpetual state of victory. He giveth us. He giveth us. It speaks of something that is constantly occurring. Something that is ongoing and never ending. He giveth us the victory. But we are the ones who choose which weapon we will employ. And sadly what happened to Israel too often as of late is happening to people of the church. For you see what got them to the place where they now had a king who at one time seemed competent enough from a physical perspective was now making one poor careless decision after another. And it all began when just five chapters prior, in 1 Samuel chapter number 8, the elders come to Samuel who had for years and years faithfully served them as their emissary from heaven. And despite everything that God had done for Israel through the leadership and instruction of Samuel, who was the voice of God to them, they began to want what everybody else had. They began to desire to adopt the ways of the world. Give us a king like all other nations have. We want what everybody else has. We got FOMO. In case you didn't know, that means fear of missing out. We're afraid that we're missing out on something because we don't have what they have. And Samuel did his very best to warn them of what it was they were truly asking for. And he told them in detail what would happen to them not, that would not only affect them, but it would affect their children as well. Because you see, co compromise is never without consequence. Compromise is never without consequence. But they refuse to adhere to the voice of the man of God. And no sooner had the new king Saul been appointed, things all begin to run quickly downhill. And I said all that to say this. The message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is not for sale. It's not up for debate. 
It's not on trial. It is still the only message that has the power to save, to redeem, and to set free. There is still and will always be one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all who is above all, through all, and in you all. And his name is Jesus Christ. Because neither is there salvation and any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men. Whereby we must be saved. And in case you are wondering. He's still Jesus Christ. The same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He hasn't changed. He's the only way, the only truth, the only life. Are there any partakers of the blessing of the gospel of Jesus Christ? Ah, come on, can I get a witness uh, in this house today? Uh, Are you blood bought? Uh, Are you washed uh, in the blood of the lamb? Uh, Did he free you? Uh, Did he redeem you? Come on, some of y'all have forgot where God brought you from. Why don't you just take a moment, uh, don't care what nobody else thinks, and just thank him. I'm free because of him. I'm alive because of him. Ah, I've got victory because of Jesus Christ. The world couldn't do it for me. No matter what I tried, it couldn't set me free. It couldn't liberate my bonds. But in a moment at an altar, God got a hold of my heart and transformed my life forevermore. How many can shout, I'm not the same? How many can shout, I'm not the same? Clap your hands and give God glory. Wait a minute. Because here it is. I set you up. <clears throat> While I do not doubt our belief in the gospel, I do, however, question our t- at times our complete obedience to the gospel. You see, we are experts of faith. When it comes to believing in Acts 238 message, not for sale, not up for debate. It's the word of God. It's the only way to be saved. We believe it. We'll worship over it. We'll thank God for it. But it was Paul who spoke to us the truth that there is a final ongoing constant step of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Does it end at your salvation experience? But Paul said, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And we stop there. We shout about it. We give God glory over it. But there's more to it. Because then he says, and all things are of God who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation to it that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them and have committed unto us. 
the word of reconciliation. And here it is. Because Christ did all of those things. Verse number 20. Now, then are we ambassadors for Christ? Some of you didn't miss it. You're just trying to ignore it. God did not save you so you can be a bitch warmer on the pew. You know what the greatest lie of the enemy is? I'm he's smart. He's subtle. He's cunning. But he disarms many children of God because he tells you he's very good at mingling truth with lies. And he tells you, man, you go to church every Sunday. You go to church every Thursday. You go to community group every other Tuesday. You're faithful to your tithes and your offering. Man, I think you're doing enough. I mean, you got, you got a family. You got a career. You got this and that. You don't have energy to make disciples. But Paul said, he made us a new creature. Not so we could just be a new creature, but now we can become ambassadors for Jesus Christ. And the enemy disarms us, takes the, the greatest weapon from us when he feeds us those lies and we believe them. Oh, you're doing enough. They can't expect you to do everything. It's right, but it's tight. Uh-huh. Because this is where we struggle. We're okay with the experience. But then when it comes to me, now becoming someone who is an agent of the gospel. Ah, oh, that's uncomfortable. You know another thing the enemy does? He, let, he helps us to make excuses for the person. Man, they've already told me they don't believe in God. They already told me they don't want nothing to do with Christ. Religion is not for them. It's not. They already said that. I know they don't believe in the oneness. They don't believe in Jesus' name, baptism. They don't believe in the indwelling of the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in other tongues. I already know they don't believe all that. So what's the point? Watch this. A verse of scripture that we quote often, but we often misuse and misinterpret and misunderstand. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. You know what it is. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you know what we oftentimes say? To be a witness. But that's not what it says. You shall be. We got it backwards. We think it's something we're working towards when God said it's something you already are. And the devil's feeding some of us lies, saying, you got to have a theology degree. you got to go to seminary. you got to be mature in the faith. You've got to reach a certain leadership position. But if you have his spirit inside of you, you are an ambassador and a witness for Jesus Christ. You don't need anything else. That's the power. Not to be a witness. You are a witness. You know another one we use? Let's go to it. Matthew chapter 16. You know where I'm going. Matthew chapter 16, verse number 18. Jesus speaking and said, I say unto thee, thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we will shout about that, man, till we purple in the face. I turn purple because I'm black. Y'all turn red. I'm sorry, did that offend somebody? And we'll shout about that. 
But then Jesus said, I will give unto thee the keys. The keys were for the gate. He said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom. And some people think that the keys of the kingdom was, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. That's just the benefit of being in the kingdom. That wasn't the keys. The keys were Jesus Christ and the revelation of his death, burial, and the resurrection. But here it is. Let me ask you this. Are there any unopened gates of hell in this place right now? It's not a trick question. No. There aren't. Why? Because the keys are being preached. And every gate that was locked has now been opened. Right? And we've heard preached before. Gates are something that are at a fixed location. They cannot move. So if there are no gates in here, uh, where are the gates at? I'll tell you where the gates of hell are at. They're at your neighbor's house. They're at your co-worker's house. They're at that lost loved one's house who has so greatly, they've, they've watched you. They've seen your example and your relationship with Jesus Christ. And they've done their very best to put on a facade that they have everything together. Even though they don't have Christ, they put on a facade to you. And they're masking the hurt and the pain and the destruction that is in their life. And they're waiting for someone to come and open up the gate. And yet we come into this house thinking that if we shout hard enough, if we praise God loud enough, gates are just going to open. Come on, we take that story of Paul and Silas in the prison too far sometimes. Because there are some gates that praise and worship cannot open. I'm sorry, did I just mess with your theology? There is only one key that, has a, that can open the lock on the gates of hell around someone's soul. Yeah, you can pray for the miraculous to be done, for God to heal them, for God to deliver them. But that's a tool to point them. That's a miracle to point them to the message. And too many times we find ourselves chasing the miracle and not pursuing the message. Oh, we want miracle signs and wonders. We want to see God do this and that. When God said, if you'll just be an agent in my kingdom, these signs shall follow them. My God, in the name of Jesus. You're pursuing something that God said is just supposed to follow you. We hold ourselves up in our cave because the church is a building, not a person. And we hold ourselves up. And the devil's just back there laughing. Oh, they ain't going nowhere. They're comfortable. They feel good about getting their touch every Sunday and Thursday. They ain't going to tell nobody about it. They ain't going to tell nobody what God's doing for them in their life. They're just, they're, they're just comfortable where they're at. And guess what he does? He disarms. The people of God disarms us, removes every sword, removes every spear, removes every weapon that could ever cause harm to his kingdom. You know why some of us struggle with being disciple makers? You want to know why? Consume with self. You know, in Luke chapter 10, Jesus told the disciples when he was sending them out, he said, don't take script, purse, 
He said, don't even take shoes. It was dirty over there, literally, because everything was dirty. Jesus said, don't even take shoes. Don't take anything. But then you fast forward to Luke chapter 22. And Jesus looks at them. He said, you remember when I told you, when I sent you out? And I said, don't take script, no purse, no shoes. He said, did you ever lack anything? Did you ever, ever, ever have want for anything? Now that you mention it, Jesus, no. I didn't lack for anything. Why? Because when you make his kingdom your priority. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things will be added unto you. You want to know that what the greatest slap to the face of the enemy is? When you're going through little hell on earth, but you still find time to meet your friend at a coffee shop and break open the word of God and say, thus saith the word of the Lord. But no, too many times we want to throw ourselves a pity party and we want to worry and gripe and complain and we want to wallow in the muck and mire of our own worries and complaints when God is trying to look at you and say, get up. You are already victorious. Some of us are too busy, too busy praying for victory. Quit praying for victory and start walking and living in victory. If you got his spirit inside of you, you are already victorious. Quit praying for something that God has already given to you. Just do what God has called you to do. And he's called every single one of us to be disciple makers, ambassadors for Christ. Get your eyes off self. That's what got the Israelites into trouble. Oh, we don't have what everybody else has. Hear me, I don't care what they've told you before. I don't care how dark their life is. This message... To him that believeth, it lighteth. Ah, it lighteth every way for them. It points them to Calvary. It points them to Jesus Christ. It points them to their redemption. But where are the ambassadors? Where are the ones who will put aside flesh? And utilize those keys that Christ has given to you. Hear me on the unction of the Holy Ghost right now. We are living in a day and age where people are ready. Quit making excuses. Because here's the thing. Now that you know what you're supposed to be doing. To him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, you got to answer between, that's between you and God. You can't say, well, oh, I didn't know what I'm supposed to be doing. We are all called to be an ambassador for Christ. Quit making excuses for them. Just text them, hey, you want to have a Bible study? And I'm not talking about something I don't know. Many of you know I pastor the HF campus. And God, I, I have on my wall in my office a list of names of people that are close to myself and my family. And I pray for them, for God to open up a door of opportunity for the message to be preached to them. And so one day I, in, in prayer, I'm praying in the morning, I'm just praying and praying for a specific family that's on the name of that board. And the husband in particular. The Spirit of the Lord speaks to me and says, text him. Ask him if he wants to do a Bible study. Kind of mentioned it to him before and he kind of just, 
you know, was, wasn't really, it's one of the ones like, oh, that sounds cool, but they never give you a straight answer about it. I said, all right. Text him, like, and I was very straightforward. I didn't say, hey, how you doing? I said, hey, you want to do a Bible study? You know what his answer was? Sure, when? And many of you know that right now, if you, in, I ain't going to get political, but if you right now live in Cook County area, Chicago, you can't really get in restaurants. If you ain't got a vaccination card or whatever. And so we couldn't meet in restaurants. So instead of making up an excuse and saying, well, if we can't meet up, then I guess we can't do it. You know what I said? There's something called a, a computer. And you could do, there's, there's this program you could use called Zoom. You may not be together, but you're still together. So you know what? We started a Bible study every Wednesday over Zoom. It, another lie the enemy would tell us, like, well, you're doing our video. God's presence can't move on in there. As I was just talking to him in our first Bible study, just encouraging him, guess what? Tears are flowing down his face. Because the presence of the Lord is not bound by a fixed location, address. He's just looking for ambassadors who will be willing to say yes. I'll teach him a Bible study no matter if it takes up my time, my energy, my finances. Stand with me. He's looking for ambassadors. And here's what would normally happen when we hear a sermon like this. Shout about it. Pray about it. Boo-hoo cry about it. It's not a feeling. Becoming an ambassador for Christ is not about how you feel. It's about action. What are you doing for Christ? What are you doing for Christ? Everybody up here, pay attention. What are you doing for Christ? Are you preaching the gospel? That's what matters in the kingdom of God. That's what his kingdom is. So to do anything less than what his kingdom is, are you really a part of the kingdom? But we'll claim the title of Christian because we go to church, pay our tithes, we do all the, all the typical stuff Christians do. But we're not down with his mission of reaching the loss. And here's what Christ desires to do in this place today. First, if you are in this place right now and you have not partaken of what the gospel message can offer unto you, you're in the right place. Today is your day of salvation. If you need direction, instruction, find somebody that brought you or somebody that's near you or find one of the leaders that you can connect with. I know Brother Ron went out, um, but find one of the leaders that you can connect with in the church and say, hey, man, what do I got to do? But for the saints, what God desires to do in this house is he wants to restore something to us. That Pastor Anthony preached a while ago. He wants to restore our boldness to declare the truth of his word. The disciples, again, Pastor already preached it. The disciples didn't pray and ask God to help them to be a witness. They already were a witness. They just needed the boldness to declare the message. So God desires. In this house, to baptize us with boldness again. Hear me. Do not base it on how you feel. It's not about feeling. It's about something in your spirit that you just cannot let go of. Jeremiah said it was like fire. Shut up. It. I couldn't contain it. It was something that just had to get out of me. That's the type of boldness God wants to give you today. It's just going to be pushing you. Somebody over there that lost, it's just pushing you, propelling you.
to deliver the message of the gospel. And then Christ desires today to give us a burden for the lost like never before. You cannot reach the lost if you do not have a burden for them. Because it requires time. Requires energy, effort, patience. But we cannot do that without a burden for those that are lost. And so if you are in this place right now and you are tired of being a bench warmer and you are tired of being defenseless in battle. Because the gospel is a part of the word, right? So if we're in the battle without having the ability and the capability and the willingness to preach the gospel, then guess what? We're still defenseless. So if you're in this place today and you're tired of riding the fence and you want to put your hands to the plow and never look back, I want you to come to this front right now.